I would like to showcase a battle example using the standard game rule set of Space Master Armored Assault. I have read the rules a few times in the past, but I'm yet to actually try them out. If you're interested, you can look up my review video. I don't have anyone to play against, so this is a solo exercise to familiarize myself and you with the mechanics. The game is supplied with four map pieces that can be combined and rotated to produce different battlefields. Even though I found pictures of them online, I decided to make my own map with the same dimensions. I am aware that it's hard to see stuff, so I will zoom in on the action. The standard game sequence is quite involved, but not much simpler than the advanced game one, and I will walk you through it as much as possible. The first thing that we have to do is come up with army rosters, deployment rules and victory conditions. I decided to borrow them from a scenario titled Unrest on Dushambe 5. Site A will have one Targ Raja, that's a tracked vehicle, one Lynx, another tracked vehicle, two Gemini Raiders, wheeled vehicles, and a bunch of infantry. And Site B have two Warmongers, two Reapers, and two Shock Infantry teams. Side B will designate the edge of one quarter of the map and enter it during its first turn. Infantry teams must begin the game carried by the warmongers. Side A can set up anywhere on the plane surface after side B designates its entrance edge. Gemini raiders may be set up carrying passengers. No units may exit the map at any time. The victory conditions are as follows. Side A must avoid side B's victory conditions and Site B must disable or destroy all enemy vehicles and eliminate all infantry teams all before the end of turn 5. There are some other preparations that we have to make before the game starts. When exactly they have to be made is a bit unclear as before the game is a vague term. Do I do it before or after deploying the units? First, I have to assign identical vehicles, not infantry, although there is an optional rule for that too two platoons of four or fewer vehicles. For Site A, the two Gemini Raiders will be the only meaningful platoon, as the other vehicles are one per type. Technically speaking, they still are platoons of one vehicle each. For Site B, we will have a platoon of two Warmongers and a platoon of two Reapers. Platoons are required to streamline the vehicular initiative system. There is an optional rule to roll initiative for every individual vehicle, but platoons reduce the number of rows. Each platoon acts on its own initiative number. For each platoon we also have to assign a platoon leader, but that will have to wait a little bit. One of the major setting features of Space Master is that crew is required to operate a vehicle optimally. However, there are optional rules for AI-driven vehicles. For each vehicle you have to roll a D10 on the standard game crew generation chart. Crew has six attributes. Elan bonus, the general measure of combat aptitude, AFV drive bonus, the skill of driving and non-combat maneuvering, heavy energy projector bonus, skill with energy weapons, projectile gunnery bonus, skill with projectile weapons, missile bonus, skill with missiles, and total hit points, that's HP of the crew. This is mostly only important if you are playing this game as part of an actual Space Master game where crew may bail out, survive and escape to fight again later. A vehicle with the highest Elan bonus in a platoon is that platoon's leader. You also have to designate one of platoon's leaders to be a battlefield commander, but that, yet again, we'll have to wait for later. Each vehicle has statistics in the back of the book, however, for each vehicle you also have to fill out a vehicle display. Let's fill out the Gemini Raiders. Right now on the screen you can see the Gemini Raider A. This is Gemini Raider B that has different statistics from Gemini Raider A due to rolling a 7 instead of 6 on the crew table. Its Elan of 50 is higher than Elan 45 of Gemini Raider A, so it is a platoon leader and a battlefield commander too, but that's unrelated. Base offensive bonus equals to crew bonus that depends on the weapon type, plus the mark number of the cannon, plus 2 per 2 firing mechanisms in the mount, that's no bonus in this case, and hard bonus. Mount type and location defines its firing arc. We have no payload palettes here, but we will take a look at them later. 
base defense bonus equals armor quality plus armor build plus EW bonus plus screen bonus. Construction armor type is not added. That's uh, only important for the charts. Hit points equals the number of tons plus a bonus that is function of armor belt. There are four vehicle mass classes in the game. Mass class is important as it defines critical hit tables used against the vehicle and some other stuff. Small vehicles are less than 1000 tons. Medium vehicles range from 1000 to 99,999 tons. Large vehicles range from 100,000 to up to 1 million tons. And super large vehicles are heavier than 1 million tons. Yes, there is a lot of bookkeeping in this game. Lynx is a tracked vehicle. In game terms, they are identical to wheeled ones. This vehicle cannot carry passengers, but has a hot bonus and EW bonus. Instead of a laser cannon, it has a blast cannon. And armor is heavier. Targraja has a more powerful laser turret. And, unlike the previous vehicles, has force shield. By default, they provide a uniform DB, but it is possible to reorient them during the game to protect one of the arcs better at the expense of others. Infantry works differently. For some reason, they have randomized HP, but I will assume that infantry teams of the same type roll the same numbers for the sake of simplicity. Infantry moves and acts outside of the vehicular initiative order, as they have their own face in the turn. However, there are optional rules that let you have infantry platoons with proper initiative. Unlike vehicles, infantry teams have no facing. They have the following statistics. AT, armor type. Why isn't it numbered like for vehicles? I don't know. Offensive bonus, defensive bonus, force, and type or quality. Each team also may have special munitions. That's shape charge demolition packs, chemical munitions, infantry mortars, anti-aerial infantry missiles, munitions for anti-laser light and smoke, infantry mines, vehicle mines or rear echelon asset directors. Power armor troopers use similar rules for the most part. That's it for Site A. As you can see, Site A has many different kinds of units, but they are not very powerful. Site B, on the other hand, has fewer units that are more powerful. Generally speaking, this scenario Site A is a defender that has to survive for 5 turns, while Site B is the attacker that has to kill or destroy everyone on Site A. They will be playing a proactive role. Below is the Site B infantry team. It has two of them. They even have personal force shields. Also, I know that the total cost is a monetary cost derived via the unit design system. A MVP is the victory point value for scenarios that require counting victory points. Aside from two shock infantry teams, Site B has four vehicles. Two of them are warmongers. Infantry teams start embarked on the warmongers. They seem much tougher than Site A vehicles. And I rolled a very good crew for warmonger A at least. Warmonger B has worse crew. By the way, I didn't mention that the battlefield commander is assigned in secret. You can reveal him during the game using your sensors. Also, these dots here in the bottom represent direct hits received from a certain arc. The more you get hit, the more severe the future critical hits are going to be. The larger the vehicle mass class, the fewer dots there are on the direct fire record. The strongest units on side B are Reapers. Reapers are Mercs, Maneuver Interface Robotic Comboids, also known as Mechs. Unlike all the previous vehicles, they have three cannons and also have payload pallets loaded with chemical munitions. One of the Merc pilot is a dork who can't use missiles if his life depended on it. Unfortunately, Reapers have no illustrations. This is the full sequence of play, including the additional phases for the advanced game that we're not going to use. The main difference between the standard and advanced rule sets is that the latter has aircraft, staircraft and submarines. Each one minute turn is split into six 10 second rounds. Certain actions can only be performed once per turn and other actions can be performed once per round. The most important things to keep in mind is that vehicle initiative is rolled once per turn and lasts for the entire turn, 
after which you have to roll it again. Initiative plays an important role, as when a vehicle declares an action, any enemy vehicle with a higher initiative may choose to interrupt it with its own actions. Also, there is one mechanic that may take some time getting used to, and that is movement declaration. At the start of your turn, you have to declare which of your units will move during the upcoming turn and place a move marker on them. Then you must move that unit during any one round of the turn. The state of the move counter determines certain bonuses and penalties. So let's finally play. The preparation phase sure took a while. Turn 1. First we have to do the turn preparation phase. None of the sides have rear echelon assets, so we skip step 1. So let's roll initiative. Initiative is rolled as an open-ended, also usually known as exploding, D100 roll, with platoon leaders Elan as a bonus. We have the following sequence for turn 1. First the Warmongers, then Tarkra Ja, then Lynx, then Reapers, then Gemini Raiders. I will remind you again that infantry acts in its own phase. Now both sides should declare which units are going to move this turn. Either I'm blind or the book doesn't tell the order of this action. I assume that it's done in the initiative sequence order, including the ability to delay placing a move marker. And then both players alternate placing move markers on their infantry teams. Side B will declare that all their units are going to move, as they are off screen right now and have to actually move into the play area. Side A will declare that only two type 300 infantry teams in the south are going to move. Round 1. The first two phases are skipped this turn because Reapers, the only units with missiles, are not on the map yet. Thus we move straight to movement. Since we have no powered armored troopers, both sides may move their infantry teams. They do not have to do that in the first round. They have to do it in any one round of the turn. The sides should make a competitive D10 roll to see who goes first and then move infantry teams in an alternating order. Side B's infantry teams are embarked on warmongers, so they will not move. Thus, side A may move its two type 300 teams. Let's do that in this round to show off how movement works in this game. The teams will move into the medium woods to get extra protection. By default, infantry teams have two movement points. Movement table on page 24 shows how many movement points you have to spend to enter a hex with a particular terrain. Both sparse and medium woods hexes have a cost to enter of 1 MP for the foot movement type. Thus, the teams may move up to two hexes and they do that. If a unit spent less than half of its MP allotment, then the move counter is removed from the map. Otherwise, the move counter is flipped over. Since I obviously cannot flip it over, I will add a red bar to signify this. Vehicles have to spend MPs to change facing, 1 MP per hex side, unless they are moving on a road. Also, you may change your facing by one hex side with a maneuver even if you did not place a move counter on that unit. Even though there are two vehicles in each of side B's platoons, they do not have to move at the same time. For example, Reaper A could move in round 1, while Reaper B could move in round 4. Warmongers have wheeled drives with 25 MPs. They spend 9 APs to move into the position shown on the map. You can't stack units in the same hex. There are limits, however. But I decided to spread them out a bit. Since the warmongers spent less than half of their MP allotment, their move counters are removed from the map. Reapers have walker drives with 20 MPs. They spent more than half of them, so their move counters remain on the map and are flipped. Now all units with move counters have performed their movements, so they will remain where they are for the rest of the turn. However, other units still may change facing via the aforementioned maneuver. Now the firing phase. Infantry fires before the vehicles. Let's explore the firing mechanics using side A's type 300 infantry teams and warmongers. Combat roll explodes only upwards. Total combat roll equals to combat roll, firers OB, minus targets DB, minus targets hindering terrain modifier, minus range modifier, minus intervening hindering terrain modifier, minus movement modifiers, plus damage or casualty modifiers. For example, in this case I rolled D100 for the combat roll, I got 79, 
I added the fighter's offensive bonus of 45, I subtracted target's defensive bonus of 55, there is no hindrance modifier, the range for small arms is minus 5 per hex, and that's 3 hexes of distance, so the range penalty is minus 15, and intervening terrain applies a minus 20 penalty, that's minus 10 per hex of woods, and the flipped over move counter for the infantry applies another minus 25. I should also say that small arms fire range is 5 hexes plus force rating, so that's 8 here. The force rating also defines the maximum damage dealt. The total combat row is 9, cross-referencing 9 and construction armor type uh, 22 on the small arms versus construct attack table, we find out that this attack deals no damage, alas. Alright, we found out that it's difficult to deal damage with small arms to vehicles. Now let's have Warmonger A fire its cannon at one of the infantry teams and see if the reverse is true. As you can see now there is a hindering terrain penalty of minus 10 because the infantry team is in the medium woods, and but the range penalty is much lower, only minus 1 per hex. We check the ordnance versus infantry attack table, cross-referencing the result of 69 and armor type LBA, that's light body armor, and get 5A. This means that the attack deals 5 concussion damage, that's subtracted from HP, and an A class critical hit taken from the blast versus infantry table. We roll 1d100 on that table and modify it with minus 20, because this is an A critical hit. The result is 28. The table reads, the ground trembles, target takes a morale check, unless it's an elite, commander or guard unit. And it isn't. What's a morale check? They are described on page 28. They are very simple, roll a d10 and compare it to the team's quality. If it's lower than quality, then you pass. If it's equal, quality is permanently reduced by minus 1. If it's higher, the team is removed from play. Our team's quality is 3, we roll a d10 and get a 7. The team is removed from play. We have our first casualty. And now let's try vehicle versus vehicle fire. Warmonger B will fire at the Lynx. cross referencing 114 and CAT24 on the blast cannon attack table, we get 19B. However, this is above the Mark 10 weaponry maximum damage threshold, so it is downgraded to 14A, 14 hits and an A crit. I roll D100-20 on the blast critical strike table with small vehicles and get 72. The table reads, explosion sends force vehicle out of control and stuns crew for 1d5 rounds, plus 4 hits. I roll stun duration and get 2. Stunned crew cannot move the vehicle, fire its weapons or perform maneuvers. Out of control vehicles move randomly during the movement phase. Lynx is at 42 out of 60 HP now, crossing the 75 threshold. Now it's at minus 10 to most actions due to damage. Also, that was a critical hit to the right flank, so I mark it on the Lynx direct fire record thingy. Targ Raja will not delay its action and fire at Reaper A that is approaching its position. cross referencing 63 and CAT24 on the laser cannon attack table we get 8. A. I roll on the Pierce critical strike table versus small vehicles and get 4. The table reads Wild Shot delivers glancing blow of false armor. Targeting bungle prevents your weapon from firing again next round. Find cover. Yeah, critical strikes aren't always positive in this game. So you know, though the attack deals uh, 8 concussion hits, bringing Reaper A to 232 out of 240 HP and marking one dot on the direct fire record, Dark Raja cannot fire in the next round. Round, not turn. That's important. Lynx skips this phase due to stunned crew. Reaper A will return fire at Dark Raja. Cross-referencing 67 and CAT23 on the blast cannon attack table we get 19. Just 19 concussion hits, not a critical hit. Since this is not a critical strike, a dot is not marked off on the direct fire strike record. Dark Raja is now at 56 out of 75 HP. Now Reaper B fires its blast cannon at Dark Raja. Uh, the combat roll finally explodes. The explosion occurs on 
uh, 96, 97, 98, 99 or 100. So I rolled another D100 and added it to the first uh, result. This is a Mark 15 cannon, so its range penalty is lower, 0.4 per hex. And I got 53C result, however that's above the maximum damage threshold for Mark 15 weaponry, so it is downgraded to 42B. A B critical hit imposed a minus 10 on the roll on the critical hit table, so I roll D100 minus 10 and get 51. The table reads, if 4 has screens, they are at minus 5, and plus 4 hits. If 4 has no screens, any cargo takes moderate damage and the vehicle receives plus 16 hits. Tark Raja does have screens that provide a plus 5 bonus, so now they are disabled. Total damage from this attack is 48 hits, bringing Tark Raja down to 8 hit points. This was a critical strike, so I mark it down on the direct fire strike record. Now Gemini Raider A is going to fire at Reaper A from relatively long range. He got a very good roll and got 11B on the attack table. However, Reaper A already received one frontal critical strike before. See that red dot on the direct fire record above? So the critical strike grade is upgraded to C. I roll 1D100 on the piercing critical strike table versus small vehicles and get 66. The table reads, Death Strike unimpeded by screens buckles Fo's armor plates. If Fo has armor belt, plus 500 hits, otherwise plus 1000 hits. Ooh, it's ugly. Reaper A does have armor belt, but even 500 additional hits is enough to destroy it. I think you can already see that Critical Strikes is the main way to destroy units, not concussion damage. Side B is taking casualties. Gemini Raider B will fire at Reaper B. Maybe he'll get lucky too? But he gets 3. That simply deals 3 concussion hits. Better than nothing, I guess. Now we have the final orientation phase of this round. There are many possible actions, but in this situation the only eligible action is regaining control of the out-of-control vehicle, that is Lynx. However, since the crew is stunned, we cannot even do that. Thus, this is the end of round 1 of turn 1. Initiative will be preserved in round 2. Now let's give missiles a try. Only Reaper B has missile launchers, so it will first try to lock on to Gemini Raider A. Lock on roll is an open-ended D100 roll, not a combat roll, so this open-ended roll can explode both upwards and downwards. The fighter's crew missile bonus is added. The fighter's EW bonus is added and the target's EW bonus is subtracted. If the result is uh, 101 or higher, then the lock-on is successful and you can launch missiles at the target. But this time the lock-on failed. None of the units can move. In hindsight, I should have placed more move counters. An infantry team will disembark from Warmonger B, just so that we can try out infantry versus infantry combat. No maneuver roll is required and the team appears in the same hex as the vehicle. The sides roll off to determine whose infantry teams go first. Side A shoots first. Type 300 uses small arms fire against Type 600, but they do not accomplish anything. Type 600 fires back and deals 4 hits of damage, no critical hits. Now the two Type 200 infantry teams have special armaments, infantry mortars. These can only be used once per battle. If there is no line of fire, then range is 10 hexes. But if there is line of fire, then range is 20 hexes. Reaper B is exactly 20 hexes away, so let's try hitting it with a mortar. This is indirect fire. It is resolved as normal, but penalties for intervening terrain are ignored and targets DB is doubled. Mortar attacks count as Mark 10 explosive warheads with proximity type for the purpose of damage threshold. And the mortar misses and is wasted. Let's not waste the other mortar shot. However, Type 500 infantry also has mortars. Higher offensive bonus and is closer to Reaper B. They have a much better chance of hitting. And they do hit. Cross referencing 37 and CAT24 in the explosive warhead proximity type table, we get 1. 
I guess they scratched the paint. Reaper B is at 236 hit points now. Warmonger B fires its blast cannon at one of the infantry teams. I decided not to target the out of control links because I want to see what happens to it. And I get 7A. I rolled the blast critical strike table versus infantry and got 30. The table reads the ground trembles, target takes a morale check unless it's an elite commando or guard unit. Just like before. I roll a d10 for morale and get a 6. This is higher than the team's quality 3, so the team is out of play. Now Warmonger A fires at the other team. And he gets 6A. I roll a blast critical strike table versus infantry and get 67. The table reads. That was close. Foe's troops are pinned unless they are guards, plus 2 hits. Thus, they are dealt 8 hits and are pinned. Pinned means that if they had a face-up move counter, it would be flipped down. In this case, it makes no difference. Damn it, I forgot about the out of control links. It was supposed to move randomly in the movement phase before other units. Let's do it now then. I roll d10 on the out of control table and get a 2. Move ahead 1 hex. Tarkraja cannot fire this round, so we move to Reaper B. It will fire its blast cannon at Tarkraja to finish it off. And we get 20 hits. Since Tark Raja was at 8 hit points, it is destroyed. Gemini Raider A will fire at Reaper B and uh, deals 1 concussion hit. Now Gemini Raider B will fire at the Reaper and he rolls a 2 on the combat roll. Unmodified 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 on the combat roll calls for a 1d10 roll. I roll d10 and get a form, that's malfunction. I need to roll another d10, I get a 1, that's a routine malfunction. So in any case, the cannon requires repairing before it will work again. Tough luck. Now it's round 3. Let's try missile lock on again. And this time I barely made it. Now let's launch all 5 missiles from this launcher at Gemini Raider A. I had a very good roll with a salvo bonus of 10, that because uh, I launched 5 missiles. And notice that there are no range penalties for missiles. Since this is a direct fire missile attack, we are going to use explosive warhead seeker type attack table with mark 10 damage threshold. We get 340d, even without the critical strike, this is enough to destroy the Gemini Raider. In this state, I don't think it's reasonable to continue this battle, as the only threat on site A is the Grenadier infantry team that has SCDPs. However, they can only use it once, and there are three vehicles on site B. Overall, I'm glad that I gave this rule set a try. Space Master Armored Assault sure is crunchy, just how you like it. And there is a lot of bookkeeping involved. I got to show the basic mechanics, combat resolution and even the unique movement mechanics. However, the initiative system didn't get its chance to shine, because I'm playing against myself. Normally it's supposed to be much more interactive. Many other mechanics were left unused, such as the aforementioned SCDPs, chemical rounds, masks, artillery support, aircrafts, bunkers, melee, etc. If you liked what you saw here, give the system a shot. I still believe that this is the best sci-fi war game there is. Anyway, thank you for watching, I will see you next time.